Chapter 1 The Gathering of the Waters And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Genesis 1, verse 2, and 9 through 10. It's May 28. Our summer begins. We're flying out from our house in Kodiak, perched over the ocean, to our fish camp surrounded by ocean. We're not thinking about this, of course, that our lives are divided between two islands, and the water joins them both, and the water separates them both. Do we think of the air as we breathe it? I'm flying out with my two youngest sons, Abraham and Micah, 13 and 11, in this summer of 2014, and my assistant for the summer, Christy. I crouch in behind them and let Christy sit up front next to the pilot. The boys climb into the back seats of the bush plane, a six-seater. It's a wheel plane, which means if there's any reason during the flight we need to make an emergency landing, we're sunk. There's no level ground on this island crossing, just ragged mountains. Sometimes we charter a float plane and land on our front waters, our own beach, stepping out in knee boots from plane to water to shore. This is the best. Should we need to drop from the sky for a crash landing, there's a water runway everywhere. Got your seatbelts there? the pilot asks, a young, fresh-faced guy. The boys strap in, arguing over who gets to hold Sophie, our Yorkie. I check to make sure Christy is fine with sitting shotgun. She shoots an excited smile back at me. I don't even remember that, the excitement of a first bush plane flight. The engines rumble. In a minute, we are taxiing off, and then we're up over the ocean, banking west. I watch the rise over the water, the canneries, the container ships towed in from a vast ocean by a tugboat, and within seconds, we are lost in a sea of snowed mountains. It's the end of May, but the snow will remain for a while. The hills in town itself will be green in another week or two, but it's the water I see most. Though we are crossing the interior of the second largest island in the United States, There is almost nowhere that water can't be seen. The deep fjord-like bays reach long, craggy fingers to massage the heart of the island. It is these two together, mountains and ocean, that have come to define beauty for me. It is not a long journey across Kodiak Island to the island we live on and commercial fish from every summer. We fly 65 miles across to the village of Larson Bay, population 50 in the winter, about 350 in the summer, counting the cannery workers. We land bumpily on a gravel airstrip, unfold our bodies, and crouch onto the wing, then jump to the dirt to help the pilot unload our 350 pounds of goods, each box weighed on a scale and marked. I'm glad to see the van from the cannery, our ride down to our skiff. My son Elisha, 18, is there at the cannery store in his full orange rain gear, our summer uniforms, sucking an ice cream cone when we arrive. He's been out here a month already, getting gear ready. I see he started some kind of beard. The boys and I jump out of the van, taking turns hugging Elisha and stealing bites from his ice cream. We unload the boxes from the van to the beach, then into the 26-foot open aluminum skiff, our main summer transport which will take us on a seven-mile pounding ride to our island. The whole journey is not even a hundred miles, and we don't change a single latitude, but our life here is a world apart from our life in town. Though the trip this year has gone easily so far, travel in this country is often complicated. I remember a trip we made out on a larger boat, traveling the twelve hours through a stormy night with not enough bunks for all. My son Isaac slept on the galley floor, rolling from side to side. Noah tried to sleep on a galley bench. I spent half the trip out gulping fresh air on the slick deck to keep from vomiting. Other times, we take our own boat, the cowboy, a pudgy scow, 
good for carrying freight but worthless in any seas, rolling like a tub. In my early years here, we took a 25-foot speedboat, until one September when we were caught in huge seas, taking on waves that nearly sank us. It was our second close call with that boat. We sold it soon after. The day after I make it here, when my husband Duncan tries to fly out, the weather has turned bad. The bush plane, a beaver, takes off anyway and makes it to Port Lyons but has to land because the fog is so thick. Then, something goes wrong with the plane. It is grounded by a mechanical issue, then flies back to Kodiak for another try the next day. My daughter, Naphtali, 25, and my brother-in-law are coming out to the island the next day on a 32-foot boat. They leave Kodiak at midnight and will travel all night around the stormy waters of Kodiak Island, the sea still swelling with the remains of a 40-mile-per-hour northeastern blow. They'll stay alert, awake, eyes on the sonar to avoid treacherous reefs along the way. When they arrive in the morning, they'll suppress their exhaustion and join the others to put out the fishing nets all afternoon. Isaac, 21, is coming for the first month only before leaving to continue his chemistry research with a professor in California. Noah is coming for a short visit, then it's back to California, his girlfriend, and the new job he just landed. It's the first summer he's not returned to work. I wonder if he'll ever come back. Tonight, though, I will curl up alone in my bed on my faraway island where no one lives but us, the island I have finally come to love. I will pray for them, for my daughter, my only daughter, out on a big sea in a very small boat. I will ask Jesus to keep them safe. I will ask for Duncan's safe arrival by bush plane. I feel guilty sometimes, always asking for this, as if safety is our right, but I keep asking anyway. In three weeks, I will be praying for my brother-in-law and nephew, who will take that same 32-foot boat a thousand miles along the desolate waters of the Alaskan Peninsula to fish for red salmon in Bristol Bay. I will pray, too, for this season on the water ahead of us. I remember the year my daughter was 17, her third year running her own boat. After just nine days of fishing, she stood there in the doorway in all of her rain gear, her hair in a bandana, her hands clenching at her sides. I can't do this, she said, looking at me in despair. I can't do another season. I looked back at her sadly, knowing how hard the last few years had been. The onslaught of salmon, the grueling weeks with little sleep, the swollen fingers. My children returned to school and college barely able to hold a pencil. There have been years, too, when I didn't want to come back. But I did. We all did. We are still here, on the nets, in the boats, on the water, in a life encircled by salmon who themselves are returning to die. What is this life I have been given? Or did I choose it? Didn't I come here following Jesus? Or following my new husband? Or both? After all these years, this is what I know for sure. This is not a safe life for either body or soul. Just gathering all of us now into this fishing life is itself a sailing, and every summer this island drifts into deep, complicated waters. Just hours after we land and load and unload our dozens of boxes of supplies from the beach up the steep hill to the house, I see a furious splashing out by the reef in front of our house. A pot of orcas hunting down sea lions? Micah! Abraham! Come quick! They run to the window with me, watching strange flippers emerge, then a huge, dark body leaping out of the water. What is it? the boys ask together. Then I know. It's a pod of fin whales. They're lunge feeding. My eyes are fixated on their antics. I almost can't believe it. Fin whales are sober whales. They don't cavort or frolic like humpbacks. They're massive, second only to the blue whale, and they haul their heft with great solemnity about the oceans. They know what life is about. 
They migrate to this bay again and again every summer like me. They've seen it all. But now, there are fresh herring darting into the bay. Now, it is nearly summer. Now they give up their old habits and indulge in what's called lunge feeding. I've read about it, but never seen it. They're feeding on their sides, skimming and scooping up schools of herring, their usually invisible flippers flapping and slapping the water. We watch with binoculars as they rise and roll, flushing the waters with their spinning and lunging, mixing water and whale and air into a wondrous froth. Why merely sink and dive when they can spin and skim their 70-ton bodies up onto the lovely surface and net whole schools of tasty fish? And there we are, laughing, witnessing their perfect feast, and who knows what else is possible in this watery world. All the next day, my steps are light with joy. I remember G.K. Chesterton's words. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he is the eternal appetite of infancy. For we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we. Is it possible that already I am young again, full of hope for the season ahead? The waters that threaten us, that wear us out and down, also inspire and launch the world's heaviest creatures into the air. Can it be? But it is. And I think again of the gathering of waters, the mikvah, the Hebrew word for that moment in Genesis, when God called out all the waters above and below into a single massive body, the seas. The same word mikvah, literally meaning collection, came to be used of every gathering of water that cleansed and purified. A convert to Judaism would immerse himself into the mikvah, a special pool of water for that very purpose, waters that were sometimes called the womb of the world. As the convert came up out of the waters, he emerged new, as a child, now separated from his own pagan past. He was called a little child just born, or a child of one day. I am a child of one day, this day, the spume of the whale washing over me. I am converted from the wear of age and time, and so many trips and seasons and fear and doubt out here, made young again by delight. And it is easy to think of God creating the oceans right now. It is easy to think of Jesus right now. So many times I am looking for him, for that man who has rescued me in such particular ways, and who remains yet so far off, so invisible, that I am blinded with longing and frustration. Other times, now, he feels so present around those waters that I cannot contain it. I know it's no accident. Water saturates the scriptures, from the Spirit hovering over the waters to the holy city of Revelation, and the river flooding its streets, and so many places in between, streams in the desert, water from the rock, the well of living water, the mikvah, the gathering of the waters. Out of nothing came water and land, came our ocean and island. Every year my children and I launch off blindly in tiny planes or boats to return to our land and sea. And no matter how thick the fog or how high the seas, I swallow my worry and choose to believe we will arrive, that the months ahead will be fruitful that all of us gathered around the table, gathered by the waters, will see and name all that lies ahead, finally good. <laughs>